Hello and welcome to Game Changers with Vicki Abelson and that would be me and my guest today is my friend and wonderful person Don Most. Hi Don. Hi Vicki. Hi Vicki. <laughs> How are you? Know, you? Yeah, I'm good and I'm better when I talk to you and that's really uh, true. I, I oh, love that's so nice. I, I love I love you. I, you know, I don't want to say I love you. You're married. I respect your relationship, <laughs> but I adore you. Oh, thank you so much. Well, I adore you too. And I'm glad to be back with you. Yeah. You're, you're you know, I was telling uh, Don before we started that we we've chatted before, but I'm going to ask Don a lot of questions that we have that I do know the answers to, because some of you don't, many of you don't, but Don, tell us about COVID. Tell it you and Morgan, Okay, wait a minute. First of all, how many years have you guys been married? 39. Oh, 39 years. Yeah. It's, and what's so adorable about you two is that you're still so affectionate and loving and in yes. love. In love. It's absolutely, absolutely. I'm so lucky. So very lucky. How did you and Morgan meet? On happy days. Um, okay. Yeah, this, yeah. How, how, what was, how, what was Morgan on happy days? Yeah, well, she was, she was, um, you know, starting out as an actress then she had done a couple of things some other guest roles and she landed a guest role on our show it was in the seventh season which turned out to be my last season wow um, i didn't know, know it at the time and um you know she came on on, on a wednesday i remember because so uh, we start rehearsals we did a reading on monday we start rehearsing on tuesday and then she came in on for wednesday and thursday and then we shot on friday and uh you know, we just kind of hit it off right away and talking a lot during during the breaks. And then um, wound up, I asked her out to have dinner Friday night before we shot the show. And and then we started dating and uh, and got married two years later. Oh, my God. So what, was it a classic love at first? Did, did you did you have that pull right away? Yeah, very much so. Yes. Um, yeah, it was it was pretty strong right away, and um, you know, it was it was the hardest thing for me was I was you know bachelor and I was on a show that was so popular and so, and you know, so I wanted my freedom, you know, I didn't want to get tied uh, down. Yeah, that was, that was the biggest conflict and problem, um, but but then I wisened up and <laughs> and, <laughs> and realized what what was important and all that. So you know, you have to go through some of that. And did you have to did you have to chase Morgan down, or was she on board? Was was she feeling the same? No, she was feeling pretty much the same. Yeah, it was. Um, and I think you know she knew too. Um, I was the one that you know was a little bit in the dark, <laughs> you know, a little, a little bit backward and stuff. You know what I mean? And um, I needed to mature. You know, I needed to to grow up a little bit. And but then I did, luckily. Luckily, it, yeah. do you do you believe in in destiny, Don? I think so because when I look back, you know, at some of the, you know, some of the key things that have happened in my life and turning points and and if not for this and if not for, you know, right. this, I mean, it just seems like there there might be something way beyond you know our understanding and destiny, and something guiding and uh, some you know other forces at work that. Uh, you know, are way I, beyond our comprehension. I, I totally believe that. Have you um, have you had evidence of that in other aspects of your life? Have you felt that before? Yeah, um, yeah, I think so. I mean, even you know, you know, like I look back. Okay, Happy Days, for instance. Right. When they offered me the part, my agent and I discussed it. I right. was up for I was up for another role in a in a dramatic TV film that I really wanted to do, and um, and and I knew I had a good chance at that. So uh -huh. when they so when they offered us to me the role, my agent and I we decided to turn it down. We passed on. Wow, Hollywood. wow. Yeah. But and so, so what happened? Yeah. So that's what you talk about fate and yeah. You know, as it as it turns out, my agent happened to play basketball every. Saturday, which was the following day, yeah, at, Gar at Gary Marshall's house. Oh, and, and Gary was the creator, you know, of Happy right. Days. So he, they, after 
halftime in their basketball game, you know, during a break or whatever. Right. Gary takes my agent aside and is like, hey, what's with your boy turning <laughs> us down? You know, what's going on? And, you know, my agent, it was, it was Mark Harris at the Jack Fields Agency. Mark uh -huh. Harris was working for them. And, and he explained that, you know, I had this other role that was looking really good. And Gary, you know, talked my agent he, into it. He said, you know, I think this is going to go as a midseason replacement. Wow. And he offered he offered me more money per episode and wow. guaranteed guaranteed more episodes for the season that I instead of seven, I was guaranteed 10 out of 13. So, you know, then we decided, you know, my agent talked about it after the weekend and we changed our minds and decided we should do it. But think right. about that. If, if, if not for him having to, to play basketball at Gary's house, who know, you know, I might never have done the show. You know, and that was kind of a turning point, yeah, I'd say. Wow. You know? Okay, so now I heard something today. I watched a little uh, interview that you and Anson did recently, which has, by the way, a half a million views. That's just how popular you guys are. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah. And I heard Anson tell a story that I've never heard before, that you also auditioned for Potsy. Is that true? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I was, I had auditioned for the role of Potsy you know, I went through several auditions and then the screen test. But what happened was um, Anson and Ron had done the show, right. had done the pilot almost two years earlier. And um, and it didn't have Fonzie or Alfie. It was, a, you know, it was two oh. years earlier. It had a different father. Uh -huh. Harold, Gould, Harold Gould played the father, but Marion was, Marion was in it. And, but it didn't sell. But then what happened was, a year and a half later, American Graffiti came out and oh. Greed and Grease came out on Broadway. And then ABC's like, wait a minute, didn't we have a show about the 50s? And, you know, and they went to Gary and they said, but we need you to make a new pilot. And Anson and, and Ron are going to be too old now. And Gary's like, no, no, they're not going to be too old. Well, they made Gary screen test Ron and Anson, even though they had done the pilot two years earlier. Because wow. they wanted, he wanted, Gary wanted to prove that they still would look young enough. But, right. but he also had to had to screen test a lot of other potential hopefuls, and I was one of them. So, so what happened? Well, was, if they'd already cast Anson, Anson as Potsy, right? Well, what happened was they called my agent and they said on that Friday night, yeah, he didn't get the he didn't get the role of Potsy, but the executives, a lot of the executives liked my screen test so much that they decided they were going to create put me in find a role that you know create something for me and there was a small part in the pilot of a guy named ralph he had a couple little scenes and um they said we'll we'll give him that part and then we'll make sure that he's one of the who will build it you know that kind of thing so that's how that happened so you actually created ralph mal i mean you made yeah. him a major character you you're the reason yeah yeah i mean it <laughs> evolved you know it evolved from combination of you know, me picking up on what they wrote a little bit and then bringing some of my own things to it. And then Jerry Paris, who was our director, was a brilliant comedian. And he loved he loved when I would come up with an idea and then that would spark him and he'd come up with ideas and that would give me more ideas. And then the writers would see what we were doing and they'd start writing my character. So it started evolving more and more like that, you know? Wow. And, and was it, okay, so I know you and Anson, in the real world are like brothers and best yeah, we are. Of friends. Absolutely. Did that did that like organically happen right away for you guys? Well, you know, we were all pretty close during the show. We were all we were all very close. Um, but you know, when I was off then when the show ended and everyone's going their own separate ways, we stayed in touch. We we all stayed in touch because we were like family. Right. But then as things happened and where Anson was living, moved to where I was living. You know, I don't know, in the last 15 years, I guess, we just became even closer and closer and closer. Uh, so that now we're like, like brothers. And even you though are. we were, even though we were very close during the show, we're like, you know, even way beyond that now. It's great. 
You are. And I, this was recently was the first time I was ever with you at the same time because you both played my living room and I've had social things and been to, and been to your homes. And it was the first time I saw you two together. And unbeknownst to you, I just caught this moment where Anson put his arm around you and just said, you know, I, I love you, brother, whatever you hugged. I mean, it was just yeah. so real and beautiful to see. Oh, that's great. Yeah, yeah that's the way it is. It's you know, it's it's a great, wonderful relationship, and like brothers, and you know, we've experienced so much together that you know, Anson will say to you know, a lot of people couldn't understand, but you know, we've gone through all that, and and then beyond that, there's just you know, a great a great chemistry that we have, and and th that I think translates it translated to the screen when we were doing the show, absolutely, and and, and it probably will again because the. It might be some stuff in the works for us to do together. We'll see. You know, I can't really talk. A, li a little birdies talk to me about it. I'm looking forward to uh, us being able to 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 drop the news and 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 share in the joy. Yeah, we'll see. We'll um, see. And like everything, until it happens, I guess it's you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. But but it sounds great. So, Don, I also did not know until recently that you consider Marion your mentor, is that true? The, I consider Marion, oh, um, well, she's definitely a mentor to me. You know, I can, I, look, I was lucky to have several, you know, Jerry was a huge mentor to me, Jerry Paris, uh, the director. Don, um, all right, let's stop there for a second. Did you, because I know you've gone on to direct award -winning, an award-winning film and a few films, did you watch him? Did you study what he was doing back then? I wasn't consciously studying what Jerry was doing, but you can't help. I mean, I, I did so many episodes with, you know, I, I did, I left after the seventh season, but I still did 175 episodes. You know, I worked with him for those six, seven years. Wow. So you, can't, you can't help but not learn by osmosis right. and absorb it. And if you ask Anson, if you ask Ron Howard, he'll say he owes a lot to Jerry. I mean, Jerry was was brilliant, and Gary too, because then I right. Gary, you know, Jerry and we worked with on a day to day basis. Gary wasn't there as often, but but especially once we went to three camera in the third season, we were uh -huh. shooting in front of an audience. Then Gary came over because he he had the Odd Couple up until then, and then he was now free when that ended. Right. And he was work and he was working with us a lot. So on Wednesdays and Thursdays and Fridays, we'd have Gary in there giving us notes, you know, seeing the run throughs and coming up with solutions. So we had the the benefit of Jerry and Gary, which is like, you know, unbelievable. Amazing. To, amazing. And then I'm working with Marion and Tom Bosley as right. well, you know, Henry Winkler. So so you know. Marion was a mentor too, you know, she set such an amazing example and watching the way she conducted herself and the, her work ethic and her and her talent and all of it. I was blessed to uh, to chat with Marion at, at, at the Happy Days Ranch. Uh, oh, right. Before the shutdown. And she was still a bit, she was not, she came to my living room and she said, I'm fucking 90. That's how she opened her set. <laughs> I, I can hear Marion saying that. Yes. I know. And she's still so vibrant and she looks yes. great. Amazing. amazing. And still working. She had a book that had just come out. I mean, she's like, that woman yeah. is unbelievable. But she also told us stories about that it was challenging for her with Tom Bosley, that he didn't really acknowledge her, that it was kind of a boys club on the set. Did you feel that at the time? Were you aware of it? had no idea until, wow. she came, until she came out with the book and kind of talked about oh. how tough it was and that Tom wasn't, you know, very, almost not very nice to her. And right. Was, you know, and my hearing all these stories and I was like, Marion, I, I had no idea. You know, I mean, we were oblivious to it. I, wow. You know, you know, I was 20 when the show started and, you know, those first few seasons and we're so caught up in what we're doing. And Marion was so such a trooper and so, you know, good at sort of not letting it show and not she and she just did her job, you know, and did right. it so amazingly well. Such a pro. So, yeah, it was a shock to me when I heard about that. 
Wow. And, and, and so now Henry Winkler's a, a Yale drama school graduate. I mean, he's like a serious thespian and here he is playing the Fonz. Right. Um, so it was kind of contrary casting. I mean, this- well, 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 it was in terms of who the real people were. It's just like I was never really, I was never the jokester in high school. I was the quiet kind of introvert, you know, really quiet. I was the straight man to some of my friends who let, fancied themselves comedians. So I wasn't like Ralph and Henry. Yeah. And Henry was certainly nothing like Fonzie, as you alluded to. I mean, he was a serious thespian, you know, went to Emerson and the, for undergraduate and then the Yale Drama School for his master's. Right. He was, he was as serious as it gets. Well, you know, when I first met Henry on the set, you know, I'm looking and he was like, very serious. Okay, that's my next question. Did so so he took it very seriously, did the whole deal. Did he lighten up? I assume he lightened up as time went on. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, I think in the beginning, you know, seeing who getting his bearings and seeing who all these other people are that he's working with and feeling them out. I felt like he had his walls up a little bit, you know. Uh -huh. and, and part of it was he was also being in character. I think part of it, he was, you know, he was already getting into the role of, of Fonzie. So, so the, some of it was that, and some of it was him feeling a sad. And then as we all, you know, after time, he oh, totally lightened up and, but, but he always still took the role very seriously in the right. work. And, and we all did. I mean, that was the thing. We all, we all took it seriously. We got, a, luckily we all got along great and had a great time, but it was a group of, really talented people who took it seriously and worked really hard to make it look easy. Right, which is exactly which is exactly what you guys pulled off. Yeah. But okay, so now Ron Howard was already a star from Andy Griffith and everything. Was there a cast system or was he one of the guys from the get-go? Ron was amazing in that in so many ways, but he was so humble and mm. down to earth and he was a star, as you said, and yet, right. you know, he, you wouldn't know it from the way he acted. He was as great to work with as you could imagine, as anybody could be. And he's, I think that's another thing. He set uh, an example in terms of how to conduct yourself. Here he is a star and he's not acting all, you know, prima donna-ish and, you know, and right. getting all Hollywood and all that. <laughs> and so, so if he's not doing that, you know, how could we we get sucked into, you know, because you could get seduced into getting believing in all the press and, right. and, the hype, and the hype and you could start to get, you know, carried away and seduced and and lose yourself. But right. I think, and, and, and it was that pull and, you know, it was it was a little bit of tug of war going on with that. But I think, you know, all the things I mentioned before, the mentors that we had and then Ron. If he's he's setting a tone, and I think he kept us kind of in our place a little bit too. What was there anybody who got a little sweet uh, sixteen magazine full of themselves? Did anybody get that way? No, no, not really. You know, I mean, I I, I think there might might have been moments where all of us, you know, to some small degree, probably you know, got caught up in it a little bit, but for the most part, no. Um, and I, I, you know, again, I feel we were all so lucky. It was the combination of all the people, the, the personalities and our mentors. And it was that combination that kept us, you know, bonded. And, and Gary even went to the extent, I think, you know, Anson will say he thinks this is why Gary did this. Um, you know, we had a lot of ball players on our team and Gary loved sports, softball. Right. And and he knew, he found out that Ron and I love softball and we were playing on, on an entertainment league and Anson liked to play. And we had other guys from our, some of our gang on the show that played. So he decided to start a Happy Day softball team <laughs> and, and he would line up games for us at major league parks, you know, <laughs> charity games. Right. So, so we would be flying together and then staying at the hotel in the city and getting on the bus and going to the major <laughs> league ballpark together in uniform and then getting out on the field and, 
you know, and wow. a softball game before the major league game. So um, Anson would say, you know, that one of the reasons Gary did this was he felt if this would keep us bonded even more and really mm. help. And, and maybe that was one of his, I think he also loved the idea because he loved the sports. Right. Baseball. But, but that, so it might've been a twofold thing. It might've been a, a factor for sure. What position did you play? Center field. Center field. Yes, put me in coach, center field. <laughs> wow. I was a huge baseball. I wanted to be a baseball player when I was growing up. And um, growing up in New York, I was a major nut for Mickey Mantle was playing center field for the Yankees. So I had to play center, you know, I had to. And I was you good got center. I was good at center field. And were you? A, did you have a good bat? Oh yeah, I hit, I hit a lot of home runs in these games. You know, softball, I didn't hit them over the major league fence, but in, you know, over the fielder's head or in the right. gap in left center, and then I get a home run. I hit a lot of home runs in, in those games. <laughs> I, yeah. bet you, I bet you did. <laughs> and you got to meet Mickey Mantle, didn't you? I did. Oh my God. Unbelievable. How did that, how did that happen? Oh my God. I couldn't <laughs> believe it. I mean, you have to understand, I was a, I was a, total nut over Mickey Mantle. My room looked like I had Mickey Mantle wallpaper. I mean, <laughs> I mean, it was covered every inch with a photo, photos of Mickey. So, um, I, so it's years later, um, you know, I'm doing happy days. And so a friend of mine was going to a big sporting goods trade show, a sports mm -hmm. show. And cause he had a, he had a, he owned a, a chain of of athletic shoe stores, a guy I grew up, I went to college with. And he said, mm -hmm. would you come to one of my shows and be in the booth, you know, and meet people and, you know, help to bring people in. And right. so, you know, and he was one of my best friends. So I, I said, yeah, you know, I do it. So I went to Atlanta and I find out like down the aisle, down there, Mickey's there for, <laughs> for representing one of the trading cards, you know, I can't remember. And he's there with a huge line of people signing autographs. And I'm like, fuck, Mickey's, <laughs> Mickey's down there, you know? And I didn't know what to do, but some, some gal came over to me and I thought she was working with Mickey. Uh, she says, do you want to meet Mickey? I said, yes, yes, are you kidding me? <laughs> so, and meanwhile, so, people are online to meet you and you're freaking out about meeting Mickey. Yeah. This is fabulous. Yeah. So she says, well, come with me. You know, so I come walking with her and I see this line, but she walks right up to Mickey and says, wow. you know, and Mickey, I guess he, she, somehow she knew him. I, I don't know what it, the relationship was. And Mickey looks up at me. And I think this was during the time he was drinking a lot. You know, he was mm. drinking. So he was, a, he was a little bit, I could tell, affected. But he looked at me. And he, and he gave me this smile and, you know, and he didn't talk much, but he looked at me, smiled and said hello, put his hand out, shook his hand. And then I got to take a picture with him and I have, have that picture hanging up on my wall for sure. Wow. Right? So that, and I was like, oh my God, I couldn't believe it. You know, I wish I'd met him, you know, when he was in a little different state, but um, it was still, still amazing for me and a great, great memory, you know. That's so wonderful. Yeah. I, I'm glad that you got to meet your hero because, you know, yeah. it, it could go really south. I mean, it went a little south, but it, lucky that it, you know. It was still okay. It was still okay. Yeah. Right. yeah. Yeah. And the fact that it sounds like he had perhaps a moment of recognition of you, it sounds like. Yeah. Yeah. Which, which is even cooler. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was cool. So, so Gary did this getting you guys bonded and together or whatever, or to be, play baseball and, and, uh, it obviously solidified. Are, are there other members of the cast that you're still close with? Well, I mean, you know, it's. I mean, time goes hard. on. I know. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's hard to to see everybody that much. Um, Ron's all over the world. He's, I think he's in Australia now doing a film. But uh, you know, but we stay in touch by email, phone. I'll see nice. him once or twice a year. You know, um, Henry. Same thing, you know, we've stayed in touch and we'll get together for lunch. Mary and I saw a few months ago um, and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of, I got to give her a call. I want to get together with her again. So it's, you know, it's almost like your family, your, your cousins, your uncle, your aunt, 
you know, and you can go months or a year without seeing them. And then when you get to them, it's, it's like no time has passed, you know? I was going to say, it must feel like, like as much your family as your family, because you spend so yeah. much time together. Absolutely. That's so exactly correct. Right on. Well, okay. So I, I said I was going to start with COVID. And then as soon as we start talking happy days, we can't yeah. stop because it's, it, right. it, it's happy. Happy days makes everybody happy. It just, it was and we need that. And we need that, don't we? We so need that. So, okay. So let's talk about that. So how are you and Morgan handled? How have you handled? What were you doing when COVID hit? Like, were you working? Yeah. Did you have to stop working? Were you in the middle? What was going on for you? Yeah, I was in the middle. I was in the middle of doing a play. I was in Chicago. Morgan was with me. We were mm -hmm. in Chicago at the time. We had done it in Atlanta. And then we we were supposed to do it for four weeks in Chicago. And then uh, we're sick. What, I can't what, remember, play, what play were you doing, Don? It's a it's a new, it's an original play called Middletown. And um really good, really interesting play, really, really uh funny and heartwarming, sad, everything. And um and I did it with I did it with Didi Khan, you know, oh, wow. played Frenchie and, mm -hmm. and so many other things. And Greece, she played Frenchie and, and TV series, Adrian Zamed. Mm -hmm. And um and and then there were other people that and Cindy Williams, the first one I did, it was wow. Cindy played my wife, then Dee Dee played my wife in another version of it. And then there was a, a local actress in Chicago, Kate Budicki, who played my wife. Um and um it was and there's they're gonna start doing it again. So um I'll probably nice. go back to it. Uh but we had to stop, you know, um we had to stop and we flew back and 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 then everything shut down so I wasn't working Morgan and I you know at the beginning the way we dealt with it we luckily we live in a in, the, in an area where we're very close like there's a lake you know basic I could almost throw a rock into wow. the lake um, so so we could walk down our street and then go through a gate and for the community and we're, it's like a private beach and it's a beautiful setting the lake and the Santa Monica mm. mountains behind it. So we were doing a lot of going there and walking around and a lot of nature walks. And, mm -hmm. and it was, that was very helpful during that time. Um, you know, and I was caught up watching the news like crazy that, that right. time. Um, and that, that got to be the point where I had to like pull myself out <laughs> because it was like a black hole. Um, yes. But, and then I start. I was working on, we were, we have some of our own projects, Morgan and I, that we're trying to get going. So we were working on those a little bit, writing, doing a lot of writing. And then I was working on, I was able to work on my music. Luckily, you know, I could do it at home but with technology today on my computer. I could bring in tracks and record, and try different songs, new songs, experiment. So I was doing a lot of work with music. And then I started getting work even during the pandemic. I, I wound up getting a bunch of work and it was a little hairy. The first one, you know, getting on that plane the first time with a mask and I flew into Philadelphia uh, to shoot a film there. And then I flew to the Czech Republic Which um, a few I, months wow. later. So, and this was in the height of the pandemic, right? Yeah, it was, it, was, it was not as bad when I went there, but it was still not great. During when I went to Philadelphia, it was in November. That was kind of at the height, so wow. that was a little scary. Wow! Um, and I hadn't been vaccinated yet. Um, when I went to the Czech Republic, I had been vaccinated, I think. So that helped me feel a little bit better. And then, and um, and then I wound up going to Santa Fe, New Mexico, to do a, a Lifetime movie. Um, so that was a third film project. And then just recently, I went to North Carolina to do another film. So I did four, you wow. know, from November till now, I've done four, four films. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how much more could you have worked if it wasn't COVID? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was so uh, grateful and, and thankful and kind of surprised, you know. And I, so hopefully, now that COVID is sort of hopefully on the last legs, um, I hope it continues. <laughs> you, you know, know. You know I, it's kind of sadly um, maybe a false sense of security because 
A lot of stuff's going on. It, things I got a thing, a text on my phone this morning from the CDC saying, uh, "Mask up. This is the the get vaccinated. It's serious." Blah blah blah. You know the numbers yeah, are not. Well, there's a definitely been a bit of a re, of a new surge, I guess. There because has of the, been because of the variant, right? So yes. But you, people... you, you sound pretty fearless, though. I mean, the fact that you were able to get on those planes and do the work and get on sets. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I, I guess, you know, I was hearing at the time that, you know, on the planes that they had really adapted and that their, you know, the, the air filtration systems they were using were so good. Right. And that if everyone's wearing a mask, the first one I was wearing a mask and a shield when I went to Philly, you know, and um I, I just felt like, I, I don't know, I had a, a, a feeling that I'd be okay and it would be, you know, be all right. I was either fear, had fearless, fearless or a little stupid. Well, I don't know. <laughs> well, well, it worked out okay because you stayed healthy. Yes. So that's, yes. that's the part that, that matters. Yeah. So Thank speaking you. of work, and so I want to talk about some of these roles that you play because they're so varied and some yeah. of this stuff isn't out yet, right? Right, yeah. Um, yeah most so, of these aren't out. There are some that I did just the year before you know, like, uh, you know, was he a, a year, the year before I was also pretty busy. Right. And, uh, some of those projects are out on, on, you know, people to see them on Amazon prime. I have two films, but, but okay. My, so wait, tell us what we can see on prime right now, Don. Yeah. And, and that thing I was going to get at is that yeah. what I love is that the roles that I've been doing are so diverse, so completely yes. different from each other. And that's what I've always wanted to do and love to do. So the, I played in the first one, um, it's called Man's Best Friend or MBF. Uh -huh. I, I was I, wondering what MBF was. Yes, Man's, okay. man's Best Friend. Okay. Do, dogs are involved, but it's a very heavy film um, oh. about, a, about a, a wounded vet comes back from Afghanistan. His dog was killed. He was a Marine and, and um, he's kind of messed up and he's trying to, adapt to assimilate into civilian life something happens he needs a defense and I played his defense attorney in it so I have some really good scenes in the courtroom and all that so th that's on Amazon Prime it's a, it's a pretty heavy film and um, wow uh, it's it's but I think people you know it, it's a little tough watching at times but it's really good wow and then then I played after that, um, uh, a small town pastor in, in this film called Lost Heart. It's a lovely film, real funny, warm, very heartwarming and um, a lot of and mystery. It's a really cool mystery. Nice. In there. So uh -huh. it's a it's it's really nice film and it's a good role for me. And I was actually just at a, a film festival in Orlando, the the um, International Christian Film Festival. I mean, it's not like a religious film, but, you know, it fits with it, the messages that it has, of, right. you know, forgiveness and, and redemption and all that are in the film. So, so it, it falls into that. But um, I won at the, I won uh, best supporting actor in a feature film. Yay. At the festival oh, how for, wonderful. Yeah. And that was for, thank you. Yeah. So that was for Lost Heart and that's on Amazon Prime. But then I did a film after that, which is an app yet called Cult Cartel, where I play a polygamist. I see that here, Don. <laughs> <laughs> so I go from a pastor to a polygamist, which is kind of a nice turn, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> and, then, and then I got a role, uh, it's not out yet, they're trying to find okay. a home for, yeah. home for it. It was a TV pilot for something called Puckheads uh, Hockey, and I play the owner of the hockey team. So, nice. um, and that was a very different thing. And then I played a prison guard after that in um, this film, When George Got Murdered, dealing with the murder of George Floyd, which is not out yet. So that's again, going from the hockey owner to the prison guard, the polygamist. Wow. And, and then, then um, I played in this Lifetime movie, um, the CEO of a, of a big company. It, um, um, it's called, um, Holiday in Santa Fe, and I'm the CEO. So I go from the prison guard to the CEO of this big company. Wow. And then I just recently did a film called County Line where I play like this career criminal 
He's like I see. Criminal. I see the picture. You look yeah. like a career criminal. Yeah. Like the seedy guy hanging out in Atlantic City, you know, <laughs> that kind of guy. So, um, so it's really been, really been fun, and I'm looking forward to what the next one's going to be. Um, hopefully, something very different from all those, you know. I see another one very different. You played the king in the Parallax oh. Tale. Oh right, I forgot that. Then I went and played. I went to the Czech Republic and I play a king. And <laughs> so you know, going from the from the prison guard to the king, it's great, you know. I, I, you know what, it, it's so funny because when I was, a, it's like I'm back when I was a little kid. When Perfect I was a, segue, go. When I, when I was a little kid, I loved to dress up in different costumes all the time and really get into, I mean, my, they told me, I don't remember this, that I would go to sleep with my cowboy boots on, you know. And, <laughs> <laughs> and I'd go to have the whole cowboy outfit. And then I was Superman. And then I was da Davy Crockett. So, you know, I'm doing the same thing now. You know, get, putting on the different outfits, the king, my hat, the criminal. You know, it's, it's like I feel like I'm back being a kid. It's great. It's fantastic. So when did, how did, how did the dream start? Do you remember when the first time you said, that's it. That's what I want to do. Like, where yeah. did the dream start? You know, I, it might have been in a couple little things, but where it really hit me when I was nine and I saw the movie, The Jolson Story. That hit me like I was mesmerized by that movie, by Jolson, his talent, even though it was Larry Parks playing Jolson. It was, right. Jolson, it was Jolson singing, Larry right. was imitating Jolson and I got the story and I got the whole vibe but from it. So um, I was like, oh, that's what I want to you know, do, sing and act, you know, act and sing. And I bought a bunch of his albums and I started singing along to Jolson. And, and then I discovered Bobby Darren and that did the same thing, got hit and started singing along to Bobby. And then I started learning, you know, the, all of the greats, you know, the Sinatra and Sammy and Dino and Nat King Cole, all of them. And, and um, so, but it started with the Jolson story. And, and was that music? I, I loved that movie. I remember it was a million dollar movie and they would show the same movie over yes. and over and over. <laughs> yes, and I think I watched it all week long, like 14 Me too. times. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> million dollar movie, that's what I yeah. saw it on. But, I, but I have no idea if, I wonder if that movie is still available to, to watch it somehow. Is. It is on DVD, you can get it. Wow, you that's crazy. Who has yeah. a DVD player? I don't even know how to use my DVD player anymore. Well, I, I still have a couple around the house. <laughs> so, so, so you, but singing, you started singing before you started, wait, you started yeah. singing first, didn't you? Yeah, pretty much because, yeah, because you know, from the Catskill Mountains, you know, my whole, my Charlie whole- Charlie Lowe, but tell everybody how you started out as a young- I, I know it's crazy that we, we had that, not only the connection of, of one of my best friends one season in in camp that you wound up dating years later i relax not that ma not that many years later i met him like 2 years after you guys were doing sleepaway camp <laughs> that's that's so funny so um yes yeah, so not only that then you 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 knew about the my experience when i was about 13 i i signed up at a at a studio school in new york city the charlie low studio and he and his wife would teach, you know, singing. Don, and did you, did you, was that by chance? Because like, I fell in love with Charlie Lowe because I saw the shows at the hotel, but no. how did you find, just by no. chance? No, yeah, what happened was, um, you know, when my parents realized how much, when everyone realized how much I wanted to do it was when I got up at my bar mitzvah and <laughs> sang a Jolson song with the band. <laughs> <laughs> I. So then, and everyone was like, wow, but they didn't know I'd been singing it ad infinitum at home along <laughs> to the record. So it was easy. <laughs> it was easy for me. So, um, but everyone was like, wow. And they, they realized how much I wanted to do this. So they asked around and one of my mom's friends had heard of, you know, this studio in New York. So, so she recommended it to us and we went and signed me up and I started going there. I would take the subway from Brooklyn into Manhattan every Saturday, 1650 Broadway, go down into, wow. and, and I'd, you know, singing, I had to learn tap dance. And even though I 
didn't want to and wasn't very good at it, but I had to and did a little act. They had a little bit of acting work, but it was more on the music. So that's what I was focused on more. And then, as you know, then what Charlie would do is he would handpick some of the best students and he, would, he created an act for them, a review. He called it the Broadway show offs. And he had a booking agent and would book, get them booked in the hotels in the Catskill Mountains during the summer. So when I was turning 14, after I turned 14 that sometime that year, he told me that, you know, I, I was going to join the, the review. He picked me. So I was so excited. We did a couple of charity events before the summer. And then, then I went up to the Catskill Mountains that summer. I was turning 15 that summer. My parents came with, you know, we, we got a bungalow at some, a, a bungalow, you know, a bungalow colony up in Monticello or something like that. And, um, and then I was doing the shows. Like, I don't know how many we did a week, probably did three, four shows a week at all the different hotels and some of the bungalow colonies as well. So I actually saw your show, which is cr I know. crazy. But <laughs> so did so. What about kids whose parents didn't have a bungalow in Monticello? W what would they do? Yeah, you know, I'm trying to remember what happened. You know, um, because what happened was my, my grandparents had a summer house, so I would get to get out of Brooklyn during the summers and go stay upstate New York, where my parents grandparents had a summer house mm -hmm. area called Lake Mohegan, and um, so this was the first summer we weren't going to be there and they got a you know got a bungalow for that summer to, uh -huh. but you're right you're right i mean if if a, if somebody couldn't do that financially you know i don't know what what the other the other kids did but the, somehow somehow they made they all made it work they got places to stay you know they and they were with their parents so your and, parents uh, would go to the show with you each each time and yeah they'd come uh -huh. They'd come as well, sure, yeah. <laughs> and there was sort of a manager, one of the, the fathers of one of the other singers be, was acting as like the manager. So he mm -hmm. handled a lot of the stuff for us and make sure everything would run smoothly and technically. And we just show up and do a sound, sound check or whatever and do the show. <laughs> you know? Okay, so Charlie Schlatter just said that you sang a song on the Mike Douglas show, probably in 1976 or so, and he had his mother take him to all the local record stores to find the single, but they oh, wow. could never find it, and he wishes he knew what the actual song was. Well, if it was 1976, and if it was one that I was actually did a record of, it was probably All Roads Lead to You, because that <laughs> I actually did a, a, an album in 1976 for United Artists, not the music that I love that I'm doing now. They made me do more like pop rock. And I just want to say that Adam Chester, who has that album All and right. who had you sign it in my living room because he That's opened right. for you, is on here saying, I said, he said, I said, you have his album. He said, it's under my pillow. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, I love it. Oh, but that's what that's probably the the song you saw me doing the Mike Douglas show. I did I did a few other songs on Mike Douglas that I were not records. Um, you know, I, I'm trying to remember what I sang because it could have been one of the other ones. But if it was something that he was looking for, maybe that's why he couldn't find it because I wasn't I hadn't recorded it. It was just a song that I did. You know? He's saying yes, it was the song actually. He's oh, saying that's okay. it. Yes, okay. All that's, roads that's... lead to you. That's yeah, which, so crazy. Which reached the top 40 actually um, that year in the billboard. Wow. So, okay. So, you, so now how come on Happy Days went that Anson was the one that was able to talk Gary into being the singer in the band? How did, right. he, how did he do that? How did he get that over you? Yeah, that's kind of exactly what happened. He, it was the first season and Anson had done a lot of, um, he had done musical theater. And so he was, you know, he was a singer mm -hmm. and, and um, he, he tells the story. He's got a great book out called singing to a bulldog. <laughs> and, th and there's a chapter in the book that addresses this specifically. He, he, he had, he goes up to Gary one day early in the first season 
And he says, Gary, you know, I got to talk to you. And Gary's saying, I'm busy. I'm, and and and, 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 and Ann says, just take a minute. Yeah, they said, okay, well, walk, walk with me, walk with me. <laughs> so they're walking and he says, you know, you got a show about the 50s. You've got all the cars at the drive-in, the girls wearing the poodle skirts and the outfits. And, but what you don't have is the music. And we could, we could have a band and then we could perform at Arnold's and do the music. And, and Gary, who was a drummer, looked, stopped and looked at him and said, Oh yeah, that, well, that's an interesting idea. And what do you? He goes, oh, I'm a singer. And Gary says, you know, you any good? And and the answer, yeah, I'm pretty good. And so he thinks for a minute and he goes, it's a good idea. Okay, we're gonna do a show. We'll do an episode, you know. And and <laughs> you, you guys will have a band and you'll sing. And then he walks away. I, I'm still boiling it if for people who want to read the story, but he walks away and then he turns around to Anson. And he says, but you're singing to a bulldog. <laughs> and Anson's like, what? I'm singing to him. He goes, yeah, that way, if you're not any good, it'll, it'll still be funny. And if you're good, and if you're good, it's still funny. So either way, I, you know. <laughs> but now, so when Anson got that part on the show, I, I know you love Anson and I know you wish him only well. Did it ever hit you like, oh, sh crap, I could have been the singer well, in the... Well, yeah, oh yeah, well, what happened was, you know, they had us, me doing some back playing piano and singing background and all that. But, you know, after the show, there'd be four shows, five shows where Anson's, you know, doing <laughs> the song. And I finally, I said to my manager, you know, we have to have a meeting with Gary. You know, I have to have a meeting. Because, <laughs> you know, here I was singing, you know, in the Catskills a couple of years, or five years earlier. Right. And, you know, so, so Gary gave us a meeting and I go in and I, you know, plead my case <laughs> very, very uh, effusively, you know, why I should be able to, bands can have more than one singer and I could, <laughs> I, I could sing a song sometimes, you know, and, and, but Gary just looked at me kind of, you know, he's very patient and seemed mm. nodding his head and, and he, God rest. So Gary, mm. you, you remember this well, don't you? <laughs> love you, Gary. I love you, Gary. And he, and he looked at me and he said, he said, if, if I was putting up an act and I needed a juggler, I wouldn't need two jugglers. <laughs> and then I looked at him and I'm like, what? And then I realized what he was saying. And he goes, you know, I can't have two jugglers. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and what he was saying is, you know, he had already established Anson is the singer. Right. I was established as like the comedian. The, and right. he didn't want to he didn't want to mix mess up the the branding and all that kind of stuff. So that was it. You know, it kind of shot me out of the water with with that one line. I don't need two jugglers. <laughs> <laughs> and but then you know they were great because they gave me a chance in a couple of episodes to do something. You know, there were a couple of episodes. There was a Valentine special where Joni's having this fantasy of all the different characters, what they're doing for Valentine's or whatever. And I got to sing My Funny Valentine. It was a, it had a mm. twist at the end. And then um, there was a dance marathon show where I, Fonzie wants me to sing a slow song because they're tired of doing the dance marathon. And I sing the anniversary waltz, which was a Jolson song. Mm. And, um, and then there was one other, I sang in one other one and we were doing a vaudeville thing. So there were a couple of chances that I got, but um, but now you know now I'm doing it the way I wanted to do it anyway. Okay, so how know? did this happen, Don? So did you put singing aside for the majority of the years of your career that you were doing all this acting? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I did put it aside because one of the reasons was also that it was very hard to do the music that I really wanted to do, the standards, the Great American Songbook, jazz, and you know all that was kind of looked upon as my parents and grandparents music you know that mm. the big band kind of sound that I love and and um so it was hard to it was you know it did it didn't kind of come back into vogue until like the 90s you know uh, late 80s when Harry Connick did it in that movie right. with Harry Met Sally and then Diana Krall started coming on big and you know Tony Bennett doing that on uh, the unplugged MTV right. thing. 
Uh-huh. And then more and more people started doing it. Natalie Cole was it was it right. I loved, loved what she did with it. So then, you know, so I put it aside. I got busy, you know, with other acting work and then directing. And I was focusing more on that, really. But then, you know, I got to a point about seven years ago where, you know, I think I was turning 60. And and it was like hit me like, you know, the music was now you hearing it on the radio again. And people, right. Michael, Michael Bublé and all Rod Stewart's doing five albums of standard. Right. So. So I realized I said, if, I, if I'm ever going to do it, I better start now, <laughs> you know, and I decided and I put together an act and um, I, there was a guy that I had worked with that I knew would be a good musical director. Um, I'd worked with the guy from Long Island that I knew, Willie Scapatone, that I'd done something with. So I asked him, would he do it? And then I'd met through Anson, recommended an agent to me that might be a manager that could help in that field and um so it all kind of came together and i did my first gig at a jazz club here in la called the the tellos and um you know it went great you know it just went great i mean once i got on stage with a band you know I, it's like right for me it was like in my blood having done it so, since i was young right so um and i and i've been singing you know, I'd done some musical theater during the years. So, you know, and then I was singing a lot, um, you know, just at home, you know, in the car to the radio, to the music. And then with my computer, I was working on it a lot and playing around. So, so I was ready and um, it went great. So then I just said, let's do more. And I did more clubs in LA, then started doing some in New York and then in other parts of the country, which led to me doing my uh, first, not my first CD, because I did that one, but the first CD of the kind that I wanted to do. Right. It's called Mostly Swinging, the most, Mostly Mm -hmm. Swinging, and with a big band and some of the great, you know, standards and great arrangements, and it swings. So, so, you know, so that came about, and now I'm working on another CD with a producer in Nashville, where we're still doing- Fabulous. And it's still some of the jazz standards, but we've mixed in some '60s and '70s music too. So um, I, I think it's like what be... kind, like what kind of uh, '60s stuff are you putting in there? Well, we did the Smokey Robinson song called "Ooh Baby Baby," Aww. you know, it's, and um, we released it in the UK. And uh, we're waiting till we finish the CD before we release it here. Uh-huh. And then we just also released. I did a song called "Smoke from a Distant Fire." that the Sanford Townsend band did, which I always loved. And then I did, uh, we still have four songs to do, but I did Ain't No Sunshine, the Bill Withers song. Fabulous. And a few, and, and there's gonna be a few others mixed in with some jazz standards. So um, it's gonna be interesting. And, um, and then I'm getting, I'm doing a, I did uh, my first show at, that I, since the pandemic, I hadn't. Oh, done you no already did it. I thought I thought uh, Catalina was your first. Where did you do your first? I did one. It was it's a jazz festival that took place of, about a month ago, um, just about half hour outside of L.A. Mm-hmm. Um, it was called the the Muck Jazz Festival in Muckenthaler uh, Cultural Center, and I was the closing night of the jazz festival, and I did it with my big band. And it was great. It was fun. Wow. So, and now I'm doing, uh, as you just mentioned, I'm doing a show at Catalina's Jazz Club in Los Angeles, which I'm real excited because that's one of the first, after Vitello's, that was, I think, the next club I did. And I really enjoy performing there. It feels like one of the old supper clubs in New York. Absolutely. And, uh, August 14th, by the way, to everybody out there. Yes. And Don, Don how it's many people? It's a Saturday night. How many, yes. th- how many pieces will you be? Uh, this one, this one, uh, it's the eight piece. I'm not going with the big band. I'm, I like to mix it up. And the last time I was at Catalina's, it was with the big band. So this time it's, it's you know, four horns and the rhythm section. And it's a little different, but it's still, it's still great. You know, it's, um, it's just different. So, um, uh, I, and we're working in some new tunes, some new stuff that I haven't done that I'm excited about. Some of the songs from the CD, mostly swing, but then there's some other stuff that, um, uh, some other, yeah, some, you know, I love Bobby. There's something that I, 
that I saw Bobby do on a old a variety show on YouTube. And I said, oh, well, I got to do that one. And uh, so we're working that. Hey, in wait, there. I know. I think there's a Bobby Darren story. Did you get to meet Bobby Darren? I did. Yeah. How did you do that? That was, you know what, that happened. Um, it was, it was around the time when I was still, you know, I was going up for commercials in New York. I hadn't moved out to LA yet. And I was going on auditions and, and I was, I, I was on the subway. I don't, somehow I had my radio or something. And I heard them say that the, the, the you remember the Schaefer summer concerts in Central oh, Park? With Ira, I used to go actually. Uh, 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 those were great. <laughs> and, and so I heard- I didn't know Bobby that, Darren did one of those. Well, what happened was I'm hearing on the radio, there was some group, I can't remember the name of the group, a rock group that had to cancel at the last minute. And they said, Bobby's going to be filling in for them tonight. And I'm on my way to this. I'm on my way to, you know, I'm walking around Manhattan when I heard it. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'm going, you know? <laughs> so, so I wandered down. The show wasn't going to be till 730. It's like five o'clock, but I go to the, to the vet, to the amphitheater where they right. do it. And I hear music. So what I realized is they're doing like the sound check or rehearsal. So I'm like hanging around trying to see where is there a door? How to you get in? And, and then I all of a sudden I see a guy walking. I'm looking and go, there's Bobby walking with a young, young boy who was his son, Dodd, who was Aww. about nine at the time. Aww. And he's walking down this path and I go running up. <laughs> and, and I didn't. You know, I didn't, I, I, I was kind of shy, like I said, but but I was so excited and I didn't know what to do because I didn't want to intrude. And I'm kind of quiet. I was kind of quiet back then about these things. Right. But I couldn't, <laughs> I was so excited to, to meet him that I was like going, Bobby, Bobby, I can't believe it. You know, and I'm saying, I probably sang Mac the Knife more than you have. I remember <laughs> saying, <laughs> and I remember him looking at me like, who is this, who is this lunatic? And but it was very polite, and he, he know, didn't know who you were. No, I wasn't. I this was this was two years before Happy Days. Oh, I was, wow. Uh oh, I lost you, Don. Where are you? Come back. <laughs> uh oh, what did I do? I don't know. Oh. We have your sound back, but your picture's not on. Uh, yet. I know. I I accidentally go down to the bottom where it says Start Video. Um, okay, hold on a second. Okay. We Let can, me put my glasses well, on. We can hear you, so that's a good thing. The video yeah. is stopped. Yeah, so uh, you want it, you want to click it so it'll start again. Yeah, but it's not lit. there's nothing safe driving mode. Tap to speak. The video is stopped. Oh my god. You know what I'll do? Wait. I'll leave and come right back in. Okay. All right. Okay. So I'll talk to you while we're waiting for Don to rejoin us. <laughs> You know, it's it. Look, we're, it's it's COVID. We're doing the best we can. So bear with us, everybody. And uh, Don will be right back. Isn't he adorable? Here he is. That didn't take long. All right, that didn't take long. Here we go. There you, there you are. Um, so, so it was so before anyway, Happy Days. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was saying. I was on an going on an audition for a commercial or something. I was eighteen. I so he didn't know. I was. I wasn't, I was just a, you know, a guy coming up to him and, but he was very polite and nice and, and um, introduced me to his son. And, and wasn't and Dodd like, his kid? Dodd. I know he had Dodd. a famous mother. Sandra D. So, oh, of course. Hello. Yes. Wow. So, wow. Um, so anyway, I was, I was very, very excited to just that I got to meet him, say hello to him. And then Sadly, I mean, this was probably 1971. Two years later, he died in 73. Wow. It's yeah. been a long time. Wow. Yeah. Well, that's wonderful that you got. I know you met somebody else, another hero, that I'm going to spark you to tell the story because it's so great. But didn't you get to meet Jack Nicholson on set? I, I did. <laughs> I did. And, and, and he was my acting hero. When I, when I really started getting serious about acting, you know, I, I was going to an acting class, a, a real, a serious acting class in New York. I uh -huh. left Charlie, I had left Charlie Lowe and I was 16. And then when I turned 17, I saw the movie Five Easy Pieces starring mm. Nicholson. And I was, I was blown away by Jack. And then I was, at, then I didn't know it. He had already done 
Easy Rider. So then I saw Easy Rider. And then shortly after that, he started coming out with a string of movies that was unbelievable. You know, um, Cuckoo's, Nest. China, uh, Cuckoo's Nest, Chinatown. And then even before that, yeah. Carnal Knowledge. Um, Carnal right. Knowledge, The King of Marvin Gardens was amazing. Oh. And, um, and, and uh, several others, Chinatown and Cuckoo's Nest, of course. So I, I was a, a Nichols, he was my acting god, you know? I mean, there were others that I loved before right. that, you know, Paul Newman and Dustin Hoffman and, and so many others that I was really, really big fans of. But with Nicholson, it was like that hero worship that I had with Mickey and Bobby. Right, and, that, right. and then they were shooting Chinatown. Wow, and, so you got to meet all your all three of your heroes across yeah. the board. Oh, wow. Okay, yeah. I'm sorry, I interrupted. I, yeah, that's all right. They were shooting Chinatown at Paramount Studios, and we were shooting Happy Days at Paramount. And I heard, I saw the saw and whatever that there that was going on on stage so and so and i'm going oh my god i'm gonna go over i'm gonna and i go over and there's a sign that says closed set but i'm in my 50s wardrobe and i don't know i was is happy days already a hit a huge yeah, hit now we're, we're we're like probably in our second season and we didn't become number one until our third season but okay we were, but we were known yeah. you know we yeah. were getting known mm -hmm. so so I don't know, I had some real, you know, balls, I guess. And I just went and opened the, opened the, the big heavy stage door and went inside and, I'm, and people are dressed in there. It's a thirties movie, Chinatown. Right. But I almost looked like I fit in because the fifties outfit, you know, you could see I was in. So people, I guess, assumed that I belong there because the people were <laughs> extras walking around there. And all that. So, so nobody kicked me out, you know, and then, <laughs> And I'm looking around and then all of a sudden I threw inside the set, the built set, I see Jack with his like, you know, God. fedora hat. And, and it was Roman Polanski, the director. And I'm like, like a deer in headlights. <laughs> and, and then, then all of a sudden they stopped the rehearsal and then Jack comes walking out and I'm like, I'm like this. And he walks right by me and I can see him kind of look at me, but then he continues off. And I went, oh, wow. Well, at least I got to see Jack, you know? And I thought that, I thought that was it. But then I started walking around the back behind the psych, you know, all the, the stuff that they, technical stuff, but I'm walking around behind yeah, the yeah. set and just kind of exploring. And then all of a sudden a door opens, I guess it was his dressing room door and he comes out and he sees me and I can't utter a word <laughs> and I can't utter a word. And then he just comes over and as nice as it could be, I think he knew I was an actor. I'm in this wardrobe. He might've known the show. I don't know, but he just starts talking to me like, hello and all this. And then I start going on about he, how he's my favorite actor. Aww. And I start talking to him about all the movies, the scenes in the movies. I'm talking about, <laughs> you know, uh, five easy pieces and this. And he starts talking to me about acting. And wow. we get in, and we talked for like 20 minutes, you know, about acting and about, all, I mean, it was like, I went back and told, I immediately went over to Ron and I was like, Ron, <laughs> Ron, you know, who I was just, I was just had a 20 minute conversation with, with Jack about acting, you know, and it was, it was, a, it was amazing. I was uh, in heaven. Wow. Yeah. That's a great, that's a, that's, that's wonderful to meet a hero and to have it be so fabulous. And Oh, it was, it was great. It was great because he was he was so into talking with me, you know, about it. It was like, wow, couldn't believe it. Couldn't oh, believe God. it. So, Don, oh, it seems like you have been living all like just your dreams across the board. You do theater. You've directed. You're acting in all different kinds of roles. You're singing the standards. You're swinging. Is there anything like that you haven't done that you'd still like to do? No, just more of more of and more, more opportunities in the same things that you just mentioned. More um, roles and, and, and maybe some bigger films, hopefully, you know, but a little bit, because a lot of these, if, I love doing independent films, don't get me wrong, I love them, but I'd also like to do some bigger ones as well. So more of the acting in, in different roles and more directing, and I have some projects that I'm trying to get going that hopefully um, I will be directing 
and and then and more of the singing in you know in in um maybe some bigger venues i don't know just more just more and more <laughs> do, do, would you consider like a a recurring role like on a netflix series does that interest oh, you yeah. at all oh yeah absolutely if it was the you know if it was a a project that i liked and working with good people oh yes definitely i would i would enjoy that I, I could see that. I, I, yeah. It's so fabulous that you're so very, I mean, everybody thinks of you as Ralph, but right. you're so much more than that. Okay, so there's two, tell us the two things again we can find on Amazon right oh, now. Yeah. Uh, Lost Heart, where okay. I play the local pastor, and, um, and then MBF, aka Man's Best Friend, both on Amazon Prime. And the and other the ones will hopefully be all coming out soon. The George Foreman one, uh, uh, I wanted George you Floyd. to talk for, uh, for the George... George Foreman, the George, I'm, I'm cooking state. No, I'm not. The, I wanted you to just talk for a moment about that because we talked earlier before we came on the air that I asked yeah. you if they take a good stand on, oh, on yeah. it. So tell us a little bit about the, the film if you yeah, can. They, yeah, they take a good stand. Uh, this was a, a project that came to me kind of out of the blue through somebody I talked to on, on um, you know, LinkedIn or something. And they introduced me to this. Wow to this uh, a filmmaker, Terrence Tykeen. Mm -hmm. um, he's a former NFL football player. Wow. Who's now he's done, he's directed two films prior to this one. And, and um, I got to talk with him about it. And um, they, they asked if I'd be interested in playing a prison guard in the, in the film. It started off as a short film. And I think it's still gonna be a short film, but it's gotten longer and longer. Because, it, you know, originally maybe they thought it was going to be a 15 minute film. I think it's now like closer to 50 minutes. Uh -huh. um, and some other good people are in it. Um, I brought them Robert Wool, who is wonderful. I love Robert. Yeah. So Robert does a role in it as um, uh -huh. one, of the, uh, one of the other like police captain. And they've got some other good, really good people. And yes, they take a good stance They you know, it, it's kind of about the what happened was when, when they when they arrested Derek Chauvin, and uh, they weren't allowing any of the white, you know, they, they cleared out, like the guards. I mean, the black guards, all the black guards. They wouldn't allow them there. I mean, it was it was all about that, and you know, certainly about what had happened and people's point of view. And but they take a very definitely take a, a, a strong stand on it. You know, Terrence is black, the filmmaker. And um, I'm proud to be part of that film. And, and it, it, from what I can see from the trailer, it looks really good. I haven't gotten to see the whole thing, but it looks really good. And um, he, they've got an offer for it on one of the well-known platforms, but they're waiting because they're talking to some of the others. So they're still negotiating. I don't know which one it's going to come out on, but we'll be hearing about it pretty soon, I think. That's exciting. Um... And important to hear that side of the story, which not enough of. Yeah. Um, and, and okay, so again, August 18th, Saturday August, night. August 14th. Eight, 14th. Oh God, I just said the wrong, four, 14th. Okay, I just had the wrong date on here. I have okay. to fix it. No, it's on the thread, right? I just, somebody just yeah. asked and I put it in there wrong. Okay, the 14th, it's a Saturday night. Yes, at Catalina's. At the Catalina Club in, which, in LA. Is, yeah, it's on, it's on Sunset Boulevard, right? Not too far from Highland. Um, it's a great club. Um, you know, they have great food. So you can come and eat dinner, have drinks, and then see the show, hear some great music. And if they come up to you afterwards and say they, uh, they saw you on the podcast, you're going to be as nice as Jack Nicholson or I was to you? Be. I, sure <laughs> I know <hope> so. you. <laughs> I know yeah, you usually, will. I, I always stay around a little bit afterwards to say hi to people. Yeah. And where can they get um, Mostly Swinging? That's on, on iTunes and Amazon, on iTunes and Amazon, yeah. Excellent. Um, I thank you so much, Don, for doing oh, this. It was, I, it was so much fun talking to you again, Vicki. Um, you know, it's kind of like we have all, all those connections and, and uh, so you feel like family too, for some, somehow. I, I love that, thank you. I feel the same way about you. Please send love to Morgan, have a wonderful, sure. A wonderful summer, and uh, I, I can't wait to check out all your projects and to see you soon. Thank you. Great Thanks, to Don. be with you again. Yeah, take take care. care.